thank you um, for the invitation, first of all, and thank you for showing up after lunch. And uh, I have to apologize to those who were in Amsterdam two weeks ago because it is essentially the same talk, except that I, I, I hope I will manage to get to the proof. This is my secret goal, but I don't know if I can. So <laughs> let's try. Um, so there are three main characters in the talk. And these are the one in the title, like, like uh, classical descriptive set theory, generalized descriptive set theory, and I0. So let's start with the first. So according to the introduction of Kekri's book, which for me, since I was a student, is like the Bible for beginning this subject, uh, the descriptive set theory is the study of definable sets in Polish spaces. And I'm, okay, I'm taking the, the, the properties. I mean, this is not a quote, but it's something that uh, is natural. So wh what are the objects here? You, are, you deal with Polish spaces, which are separable and completely metallizable spaces, like the real line, the complex numbers, but uh, most notably for set theory, the counter space and the bare space, okay? And then what means definable, of course, it's just, you know, vague notion, but in, uh, in this area, usually you deal with Borel sets or maybe analytic sets, slightly more complicated, or if you want this is uh, various level of definability. And then you deal with regularity properties, the perfect set property, which says that uh, a subset sum of these spaces either as sites of um, at most countable or the counter space topologically embeds into A. And of course, then there are many other, like their property, the measurability, and so on and so forth. And let me mention something that all, all of you know. Uh, Cantor was the first proving that all sets, uh, all closed sets of, uh, well, of the real lines, but of any poly space, actually, uh, have this regularity property, the perfect set property. And ma I'm mentioning this for two reasons. First of all, this is a conference in honor of, of Cantor, so I'm mentioning Cantor at least uh, once for one of his major contributions. And secondly, because this will be the regularity property we will focus on in this talk, okay? Okay, so uh, after uh, some time, people start looking at other contexts, uh, trying to extend classical descriptive set theory in, vi in various directions. So usually the approach is, change the class of spaces you are looking at, motivated by something, and then uh, post regularity and so on, and see what you can get. So one, one of these, uh, an example of this, is uh, when you try to drop separability and keep complete, complete metalizability. This is very natural in topologies like uh, the normal thing. I mean, separability is just an exception, uh, while metalizability is, of course, it's something very special, but it's, uh, a more, more solid notion. And it's natural because in this way you can approach non-separable Banach spaces, for example, or other kind of objects which are natural in mathematics but don't fall in the usual setup of classical descriptive set theory. And I'm picking one specific paper uh, using this approach, which is a paper by, by Stone, very old, as you see, in which he is doing the following move. He considers as spaces what he calls bare spaces, uh, which are just countable product of discrete spaces. And most not notably, he concentrates on countable product of um, a set of a certain size lambda with a discrete topology. Or when lambda is cofinality omega, he picks a, a cofinal sequence in lambda and makes the pro product of this cofinal sequence. Why it does so? Because if lambda equals omega, these are exactly the bare space and the counter space, more or less. Okay? So this is a natural generalization. And of course, he wants to keep all the rest more or less the same. So for definable sets, for example, he uses the usual Borel sets. And I mean, uh, the sigma algebra generated by open sets. Except that, that when moving to um, analytic sets, he, he moves to lambda analytic sets, continuous images of um, B lambda. And for regularity properties, he considers the lambda perfect set property which is the version at lambda, so either a set of size lambda, at most lambda, or contains a copy or of properties is forced by the fact that there are sets which doesn't satisfy the perfect set property if lambda is greater than omega. So this is the unique thing that you can, can somehow expect, otherwise the lowest version are clearly false. And why it is uh, B lambda here and B lambda here? Well, because this is uh, the space, uh, this, the most natural space, and also uh, one can wonder why it is the version of the bare space and not the one of the counter space here. I mean, the perfect set property is the counter space that embeds into the set. Well, the point is that, first of all, the counter space uh, with lambda not of cofinality omega is not defined in this context. And second, when it is defined, then this is homomorphic to V lambda, right? So it's the same as embedding the version of the counter space that Stone was considering. So this is something proved by Stone. 
And he proves many things, including classical stuff like all Borel and uh, even all lambda analytic subsets have the lambda perfect property or something like that. So this is mirroring the classical context into a non-separable uh, context, but keeping matrix and complete metalizability. Then there is something uh, different which drops uh, both separability and complete metrizability. And this is what is called generalized descriptive set theory, it's the second uh, character of the talk. Here the idea is just, well, replace uh, omega with some uncountable cardinal kappa anywhere. In any possible definition that you encounter, you just replace omega with kappa and see what happens. So uh, I'm not sure about the motivation at the beginning. A posteriori I can say, well, because it, it, it produced a lot of interesting results, for example, connection with shell stability theory and many others. So a posteriori you can definitely say that it's interesting. And uh, if you search the literature, actually it's an idea that it's you know, coming up and then going down again for a while, for, be forgotten for some years, and then it shows up again and be forgotten. So there is a paper, there are some papers in the 70s, then there is nothing until 19s, then there is nothing until 2000. Somehow it's uh, an oscillation, but it's all different reasons. So what's the setup here? Well, here you deal with the so-called generalized counter in space, which are two to the kappa or kappa to the kappa. So here I'm just replacing omega with kappa everywhere. What's the topology? Of course, you can choose many different topologies on these spaces, and well, they are all interesting, but one of the natural choices, which is the most frequent in all these papers, is to take the usual definition on the counter in space, uh, but the definition given by producing a base for the space and generalizing this. So generalizing the base for the counter in space, so taking sequences S of length now less than kappa, and then take as basic open set all sequences which extend this specific S, okay? So this is the topology that we put on the space, and uh, now since we have to replace every occurrence with, of omega with kappa, also in Borel set we do not stay with the original Borel set because it's not countable unions, but you rather say kappa unions, right? This is the spirit of, the, the, of this area. So you talk about kappa plus Borel set, which means sets in the kappa plus algebra generated by open sets. I think it's cutting somehow the, I, I, I'm sure that there is an open uh, there. So probably it's cut a, a little bit to the right side of the slides. I don't know why. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, you will miss some words here. <laughs> it's still understandable. Here, for example, is open by open sets. Okay, and as analytic, you take cap analytic. Cap analytic means, in this context, continuous images of closed subsets of the bare space, uh, which is, again, equivalent to the original notion if kappa equal omega. And then you deal with regularity proper. Perfect property becomes the kappa perfect property, which means either you have size less or equal than kappa, or, or the generalized counter space embeds into your uh, thing. And now here I have to put two to the kappa because, uh, in contrast to Stone's setup, it's not, not always the case that two to the kappa is the same as kappa to the kappa. I was trying to figure out <laughs> what's going on. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, and of course you also talk about other properties like the kappa bare property when it makes sense. I will spend a few words on this. Or other combinatorial regularity properties like in Yuri Komsky talk, uh, there, there were some, something connected to this. Okay. Usually in this setup, one makes this assumption. Kappa to the minus kappa equal kappa. Why it is so? Well, the idea is that of course you are dropping separability and complete metalizability, but you want a separability-like notion. I mean, you expect these spaces to have a dense set of sites kappa, or equivalently in this context, it's not equivalent in general, but uh, a basis of sites kappa. And this condition is exactly what you need to have the bare space to have a dense set of sites kappa, okay? The, the smallest dense set of this is always kappa to the minus kappa. So if you want to have kappa size, you have to put this condition, okay? This condition can be rewritten, this is really important for the talk today, as the conjunction of two items. First, kappa is regular, and secondly, two to the minus kappa equal kappa, which is likely weaker than this if it is taken alone, but in conjunction with regularity is the same condition. And actually, I divide this because this, this part on the left, the regularity, is what uh, makes you um, lose the metrizability. Because these spaces are metrizable, in fact, completely metrizable, if and only if they are first countable, so they have a countable neighbor basis for, um, around any point, and if and only if the cofinality of kappa is omega. So if kappa must be uncountable, but you want uh, uh, to, to, to have um, 
metrizability, you cannot have kappa regular. So when you have kappa regular, you immediately rule out metrizability. Okay? Now, the theory, uh, if one follows uh, some talks or reads some papers, is extremely uh, rich and interesting. One point is that it's completely different to cl from classical descriptive set theory, both in the results and in the method. Okay? The idea is that you take the definition, but you end up with something completely different. So you're do not doing any, any, any kind of descriptive set theory. It's called generalized descriptive set theory, but somehow it's a different, uh, it's a different, uh, different subject. Um, one, one thing that can be noted is that most of the non-trivial results either are just false in the generalized context or at least independent, okay? So for example, think about the results of, uh, of Cantor, closed sets of the perfect set property, here is independent of ZFC. Uh, take, uh, for example, the losing separation theorem, the, the possibility of separating two anal disjoint analytic sets by a Borel set, here is simply false, no way to do that, okay? And also the consequence that uh, B analytic sets are Borel false, okay? So this is the typical situation that you have. Okay, so at least for people working in classical descriptive set theory, this looks like, okay, uh, if you want to do that, it's fine, but uh, it's, you, then you are moving to another subject somehow, right? Uh, however, there is a general trend that is emerging in these years with many, many results in this area. And the trend that uh, I, know, I don't know how many people do agree, but <laughs> this is my view, that large cardinals usually helps you in getting closer to the original picture. Either the presence of large cardinals or the fact that you are work, working with kappa, a certain large cardinal, okay? So for example, I put here one example. If you take kappa weekly compact, then you recover at least that two to the kappa is not homomorphic to kappa to the kappa, so these are different. And one may say, oh, do you really need weekly compactness? Yes, because in all the other cases, they are, they are homomorphic. And this is striking contrast to the classical case. So if you get weekly compactness, then you get something more, okay, a little bit more. Another example is that if you have an inaccessible and you collapse it, like in the Solovay model, then you get regularity properties for definable sets in that case, also in the generalized context, just as you get them in the classical context. The technique is slightly different, but it's the same. But you need an inaccessible, otherwise you don't get it. And also, I, I can mention that, for example, if you look at certain specific model, like the constructible universe, uh, well, I don't know if this is an accident or not, but surely you don't have many large cardinals uh, in L, and what happens, I don't know if this is by coincidence, is that essentially all pathologies show up, show up. So this is the worst model to work with generalized descriptive set theory. I don't know if it depends on the cardinals, but could be. Okay, so when I was uh, giving some talks uh, on this, uh, Mirna Zamonia was uh, in the audience at some point, actually I told these talks, and both times she insisted, why don't you look at singular cardinals? They could uh, behave better, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, she managed to do actually some work on singular cardinals together with Yoko Van. And I guess she will talk a, a bit about exactly this work she, had, she has done with uh, Yoko. And uh, okay, and so I, I received this September. I, I got another input by Woodin, listening to another talk in this area, and saying, oh, you know, uh, large cardinals gives you a better picture. Why do you don't look at I0, which is the large, largest cardinal you can expect maybe to have the best, the optimal behavior? And unfortunately, the point is that if you work with I0, then the, the cardinal you are dealing with has countable cofinality. So of course, you are running out the, the usual setup. You have to move to something else. So both of them are suggesting look at singular cardinals, possibly with some large cardinal assumption, and maybe you will get something better. So, and here enter the third character, which is I0. So, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. If you are not, don't worry. I'm not familiar with that too, so <laughs> you are safe. I'm not going to explain nothing deep because I don't know exactly how things go there. I will just remind you about the definitions, okay? This is the only thing that is important for me uh, in this talk, I mean. Um, so what is I0 at certain lambda? At a certain lambda means that there is a non-trivial elementary embedding between L of V lambda plus one into L of V lambda plus one with critical point below lambda, okay? This is barely close to the uh, Kuhnen inconsistency. I mean, Kuhnen says you cannot have an embedding from L V lambda plus two into V lambda plus two, and this is, you know, slightly below. Actually, the I stand for inconsistent because people were believing that these two was inconsistent, but no one find the proof of that, so now people start to work with it. I zero is just the state to uh, have this property, okay? And uh, what is relevant to this talk is that Woodin started to consider V lambda plus one, the power set of V lambda plus, uh, v lambda plus two, which is the power set of V lambda plus one, 
is large cardinal version of, of subsets of the reals. Okay, and the analogy goes as follows. V lambda is the same, is the analog of V omega, the, because lambda is countable cofinality, and V omega is barely the same as omega, is V. <laughs> okay, and now if you take V lambda plus one, what is this? It is subset of V lambda. And if you take subset of V omega, or better, of omega, what you get, you get subset of natural numbers, which are the counter space, essentially. Okay? So V lambda plus one is the same as the counter space, and then when you do subsets, you are doing something analog. This is his point of view. So this suggests the definition of a topology on V lambda plus one. V lambda plus one is the analog of the counter space, so we need a topology if you, you want to have some similarity. And this is the, the topology. It's the same as in the counter space. You specify a certain bounded set in the hierarchy, so it must appear, uh, it, mu it must be contained in some V alpha for alphas less than lambda, so you decide an initial segment, and then you take as basic open set all sets, which up to the level alpha agree with that thing, okay? So it's like before specifying a sequence S and taking all possible extensions. So up to level S you have to be the same, and afterwards you, you do whatever you want. So here is essentially the same definition. And his claim, uh, which I heard many times, but I couldn't actually figure out what, what was the meaning, is that somehow the theory of the subset of this generalized version of reals is more or less, uh, well, it's very close in a sense, it's reminiscent of the theory of subset of, real, uh, of the reals in the inner model L of R under uh, determinacy, okay? So this was his claim. You have some inner model, which is L V lambda plus one, which su should be the same as L uh, v omega plus one, which is the same as uh, L of R, and I zero gives a picture which is analog to what Adi gives on this other inner model. This is more or less the claim. So what's a natural test for that? Well, Cantor perfect property, okay? Because this is something that follows from Adi, it holds in L of R if you have enough uh, Adi. Uh, therefore, let's see what happens. And Rudin uh, himself was able to prove something in this direction. In the statement, you will see something called UJ representability. Don't worry about that. It's a technical notion that I cannot fully understand. It's very difficult. I will present an abstract version that for me is understandable. And it's much context. So just forget about UJ representability. So what, what Budin was able to prove is just a lemma in his um, big paper, is that if you have a UJ representable set, which is the analog of being determined in the classical context, more or less, in some sense, then it satisfies some dichotomy, which is either it has size less than lambda or the usual counter space embeds into it. Now, this is quite weak because, of course, lambda is way much larger than the counters, uh, the, the, the continuum, right? So the point here is that in the second alternative, you have to embed it topologically. So you must preserve some structure. So it, it's not difficult, it's not deep, but it's not trivial either, okay? This was the first one. And then was later improved by uh, many students of Woodin. For example, she proved that um, for example, cut the universe, uh, this inner model at level lambda, then um, every set in there satisfies the real perfect property in this context. So either a size less than lambda or not the classical cantor, but the generalized cantor embeds into it, okay? And here I'm putting C lambda, where of course they were not mentioning stone, but they were mentioning this, which is the, the definition of stone. So this is why I use stone's no, notation, okay? And this is a much larger space, okay? It has size two to the lambda, okay? Good, and then she was, uh, uh, well, the same proof was for uh, all subsets in the inner model, if you assume that all of them are UJ representable. So it, this is the analog of having ID. If all of them are UJ representable, then you get the dichotomy, uh, the perfected property dichotomy, okay? And actually, the final step is Kramer who removed the, the hypothesis of UJ representability. He used a completely different technique to prove that it's true that if you assume a zero lambda, then all sets have the perfected property, just that, as it is true that if you assume AD, all subsets of the real have the perfected property, okay? This is the final step. Now, I cannot understand this proof because as I said, I'm new to the subject, so I, uh, they use a lot of machinery specific to this very model and this large cardinal and so forth. So, I mean, because of my ignorance, I could not really yet follow all, uh, all their proofs. But I will show you something which will reprove, well, part of this result uh, later. Okay, now, this is the setup of Woodin. So let, let's go back to generalized descriptive set theory and work with singular cardinals, because this is what was suggestion, uh, the suggestion of Mirna, Woodin, and so on. So what can you prove? Easy exercises. If lambda is singular and you take any cofinal sequence, lambda i, you can immediately prove 
that the following spaces are equivalent. The generalized counter space, the natural thing, is equivalent to the product up to the cofinality of lambda of these cardinals to the lambda i. So this is taken with a discrete topology. It's not a generalized space. It's just some cardinal with a discrete topology. So you make the product, product of length mu, mu and on the product you, you put the length. Or you take the soup of all these two to the lambda i, and you make just a mu product of that. And that, that, they, these are all homomorphic. And this is kind of an exercise that appears in this paper with a different terminology, and we just reprove it by accident before knowing that they were doing exactly the same thing. Okay? But it, it's really more an exercise than something else. But it's very useful because, now, remember that the condition, the usual condition is, would be lambda to the lamb, less than lambda equal lambda, which we cannot have because this is regularity plus something else. And we are not going to deal with the regular uh, cardinal. So if you drop this, you end up with a singular cardinal satisfying the second half. And what does this mean? Well, this is equivalent to saying that lambda is strong limit. So this is what you are looking at. You are looking at are singular cardinals which are strong of countable cofinality, uh, well, singular in, of any cofinality at this moment, uh, which are strong limit. And if you are strong limit, if you add this condition, then the previous uh, proposition means that you can uh, say that 2 to the lambda is homomorphic to just the product of the countable uh, cofinal, of the, yeah, cofinal, not necessarily countable sequence, which is homomorphic to lambda to the cofinality of lambda. So this is an improvement because you deal uh, not with. And you immediately recover that this space here to the lambda is not the same as lambda to the lambda because they have different weight. So these are, have weight lambda, this is a weight lambda to the minus lambda, which is, since lambda is singular is greater than lambda for sure. Okay, so these are different. And moreover, and this is our setup, if you take singular with countable cofinality, then read this space, uh, space here, what is this? This is just stone C lambda. What is this? This is just stone B lambda. So our generalized counter space with lambda of countable cofinality and strong limit becomes just those spaces studied by stone. Okay? This is fairly important for the theory because what you get is that 2 to the lambda now is not only a metrizable space, but is a completely metrizable space of density lambda. So you are forced back to something much closer to classical descriptive theory, just considering non-separable, non completely metrizable spaces. Okay? So it's a little bit less esoteric. I call this lambda polish. I don't know if it is a standard uh, terminology. Okay. And once you realize this, and you realize this homomorphism, then you immediately got a very uh, nice picture, much closer to the classical setup. So for example, you can work with this space, or more generally with what can be called uniformly zero-dimensional. Well, you don't have to read it. It's some version of zero-dimensionality, mm, a little bit stricter than that. In topology, it's known as ultra-paracompactness, for example. It's some notion that exists in topology. And what can you prove now is that in this setup, the space 2 to the lambda, the counter space, is universal for these uniformly zero-dimensional spaces, which is the same as in the classical case. The counter space is universal for zero-dimensional poly space. Other things that you can get is you get this all closed sets are retract of the entire space, which is something true in the classical context, and it simply falls in the generalized context if you assume kappa to the minus kappa equal kappa. Here you get, again, the classical result. And for example, you get every space is actually a continuous image of uh, to, to the lambda, OK? So for those who know basic results in classical description theory, it's just natural and familiar. is exactly what you see in the Kekris book, except that you replace uh, omega with lambda. And then you can go on. Uh, by the way, this applies also to Woodin setup. This is why Woodin uh, setup is in here, because if you take Woodin setup, well, just look at the definition, you look at this space with the topology of Woodin, well, this is homomorphic just to this thing here, okay? Ex again, as in the previous case, it's just a basic uh, exercise. And therefore, if lambda is limit of, of inaccessible cardinals, which is the case, of course, if you have I0 lambda, then what you get is that Woodin space is exactly the same as C lambda, stone space, exactly the same as B lambda, exactly the same things as 2 to lambda. So actually, in this time, we are doing all the same thing. Stone, generalized descriptive theory, Woodin I0, it's all about the, same, the very same space, OK? So there should be some connection, I guess, right? <laughs> Since it's the same object, uh, this is what I expect. OK, 
What about the other objects, definable sets? Of course, here we are taking the standing point of generalized discrete set theory, so we deal with lambda plus Borel set. There is nothing to say, of course, this form a hierarchy, which is stratifi stratified in lambda plus sets. The unique point is that you somehow need some different proofs for certain things, but I mean, the picture is exactly the same. The other point that one can notice is that since lambda is singular, lambda plus Borel is the same as lambda Borel, because a union of size lambda can be done via union of sides, cofinarity of lambda of sets of smaller sides, so you can do something better, but I mean, it doesn't influence uh, the, the theory. Of course, the same holds for the generalized best space. Um, what for analytic sets? Okay, in the classical context, you have this definition. I, a is analytic if it is a continuous image of a polyspace, or it is either the empty set or a continuous image of space, or continuous image of closed subset of the bare space, or many other things, okay? When you move to the generalized context, you replace omega with kappa, kappa what happens is that three to six are still equivalent, but two and, one, two and one are not equivalent. Two is literally not equivalent to three, and for one, you don't have a national notion of Polish space to replace Polish with something else, okay? Now, if you move to this uh, countable cofinality stuff, plus or limit, then you get exactly the same analog, because now you have an analog of Polish space. What is the analog is just completely metrizable space, with a different density, density lambda. And so you get one, exactly one, and then you get also two and three and so on. The unique point that you have to notice is that here we are not putting the generalized bare space lambda to the lambda. To be equivalent, you have to put lambda to omega, so stone space, not the generalized bare space. But if you do this move, then you are safe. Also, here is two to the lambda, but this is homomorphic to that space. <laughs> so it's just different notation for the same space. So if you do this move, what you recall is exactly the notion of lambda analytic set of Stone, okay? And so you get all the results that uh, Stone got. Just a quick word. If you put here lambda to the lambda, then you get a completely different notion, which is coarser, and includes not only this kind of analytic sets, but also the co-analytic with respect to this definition, and also if you have certain condition on lambda to minus lambda, all projective uh, things are here, are continuous image of closed sets in lambda to lambda. So, this other version is clearly something which is not the, the, the real thing that you want to deal uh, with. Okay, and we don't have just this, but the point is that our definition, or Stone's definition, is the correct one because you recover, for example, that, um, well, of course, lambda analytic sets contains all lambda plus Borel sets. They are closed under unions of cell lambda, intersection of size lambda, and so on. But what uh, is amazing is that with the very same proof as in the classical case, you recover, uh, what, what's, uh, um, sorry. Yes, yes, as in the generalized context. Lambda, lambda plus. plus, definitely, definitely, okay. Um, okay, sorry, uh, coming back, what you got is that lambda linear sets are sufficiently closed, and what happens is that you recover Suslin theorem, losing theorem, so separation theorem, for example, and of course the fact that all the analytic sets are lambda plus Borel and something. I mean, these are, are all similar to the classical case, just with lambda in place of that. And remember that this is false if you work with the regular cardinals, for example. Okay, so Mirna was a little bit right. You get a better picture with singular <laughs> cardinals, right? Okay, and you can go on because this has many consequences: graph of Borel functions, ima injective images of, uh, of Borel take the Keckley's book and just read that chapter and what follows from it and everything goes through. Just because you are working with spaces which are uh, more closer to the bare space. Okay, uh, now, last 20 minutes, let me move back to the perfect property. This is the, the only non-trivial part uh, of the talk, although the results are known. As I show you, Kramer already proved the best result that can be proven, okay? But I want to show a different proof. So, uh, remind that uh, the property. So a subset of the space has the lambda perfect set property if either it is of sites at most lambda or the generalized Cantor space topological embeds into A. Now, since this two to the lambda is stone space, you immediately get that, stones prove that, that all lambda analytic sets have this perfect set property, okay? It's just stone proofs. It's just that we call it two to the lambda instead of B lambda or C lambda, but topologically it's the same. Can we go further? 
Well, let's think about the classical case. Until analytic set, until analytic set, you can just prove this with a classical argument. If you want to have the perfect set property for more complicated set, you need to have some determinacy or something like that to go over, right? And actually, uh, if you look at the papers from the 80s and the 90s, uh, when they were trying to prove that ID is consistent somehow, so it follows from large cardinals, they were working with the notion called kappa homogeneity Suslin sets, okay? And showing that kappa homogeneity Suslin implies a lot of consequences of, of ID, okay? So this, this was the idea. Actually, this notion is what inspired good in, in defining this magic UJ representability, which I'm not talking about. It's the, like in a higher version level of ability. So notice indeed, we just started, okay, let's take this seriously and work with the same technique they were using in the 80s, but at level of A0, and see what, what happens. So here is the definition. This is something which generalizes both kappa weakly homogeneous uh, in the classical context or UJ representability. So it's something more general. Um, what do we do? Well, first of all, we need uh, some family of ultra filters or measures. And we need that this insist on finite powers of a certain fixed set kappa. Uh, okay. Ultra filters insisting on this thing, on K to N. Okay, for some n. Okay, each of them insists to some finite product of some set k. So you start with some set k, k usually is la large cardinal, something like that. You make finite product. Each of these ultra filters insists on some of these finite, uh, so measure one on some, some level. In fact, this n, then, where you see where the ultra filter is, is actually called the level of the ultra filter. Okay, because all the rest is measure zero and doesn't count. Okay, now what is a tower? A tower of ultra filters from such a family is just a countable sequence of ultra filter, so indexed by national numbers. The point is that if you are at, uh, in the nth place, the ultra filter must insist of sequences of length n, so the level must be the same as the index. And if you have something which is, uh, uh, this should be, okay, n greater than m, so if you are uh, at an higher level and look at something uh, below, the filter on top should project on the one below. This means that you can recover the filter below from the filter above, just taking the filter below, take a set, you just extend all its elements uh, to the, the length uh, n, and you see if this is measured one by the other set. So projection is some way, in, in fact, you don't need a, the entire tower, you just need a cofinite sequence of ultra filters to know the tower, okay? Because this projection will allow you to fill the gaps if you just have a cofinite sequence. Okay, and this tower is well founded if and only if for every sequence of measure one sets, measure depending on the ultra filter in the X index. So A0 must be measure one by U0, A1 by U1, A2 by U2, and so on. So you measure one set, then the, uh, the tower is well founded if for any possible choice, you have a branch with, which meets all this set, okay? This is related to well foundedness of uh, the limit of the ultra products. Okay, this is why it is called well-founded. Okay, this is the notion of well-foundedness. Okay, so this is a basic object. Now, what, what means to be UK representable, which is the same as UJ or weakly homogeneous resistance? Okay, take kappa uh, greater or equal than lambda, so this kappa appearing definition is this kappa here, and th then you need the family of orderly, uh, orderly family of ultra filter. Orderly means that insists on these finite sequences. And now, the role of kappa is to specify the level of completeness of the ultra filters. So when you say you kappa representables, it means that all ultra filters are kappa complete. This is the role of kappa, okay? And then the definition is the following. If you take a subset of lambda to the omega, which is the same as two to the lambda, or of Boudin's Gu lambda plus one, they are all the same. So if you take a subset there, this is uh, UK representable. If through product of finite sequences on lambda, into the ultra filter, so it assigns an ultra filter to any pair of sequences of the same length, such that if two sequences uh, have a certain length, i, then the ultra filter associated must be of level i, so insist on the same length. And then what happens if you take two sequences of certain length and try, and length and try to extend them, then the ultra filter associated to this extension must project onto the previous one. So if you extend the sequences, you are extending the ultra filter in the sense that the new one must project onto the old one. And finally, this is the representability, I mean, which matches with Z, Z, the Zeta, Z. 
is that you can recognize that if a point is in Z by checking whether there is some Y such that you take the pair X and Y, cut it at all, all final level, look at the ultra filters associated at, uh, to this by phi. Well, this is a tower of ultra filters by definition, and you check whether it is well founded. So X belongs to Z, uh, Z if uh, there is a Y such that the tower of ultra filter associated is uh, well founded. This is not mentioned in the second part. I what? what? O X, O K, O raptor. Okay. Okay, so this is the definition. And as I said, if you take lambda equal omega, well, it's not the very definition of weakly homogeneous Suzlin, but it follows from it. I mean, it's very close in spirit, and it follows from weakly homogeneous Suzlin. So, so weakly homogeneous Suzlin are certain cap UK representable set for a certain family of ultra filters, which is a more specified family of ultra filters. Here I'm more generous, okay? But also in the uh, Wooden's context, UJ representability is just its thing, except that now kappa must be lambda plus, there is a plus hidden there, and the family of ultra filters is some very strange to me family of ultra filters that you have to consider, which is related to the embedding J, of course, and, and to some other parameters. But you know, you can con uh, abstract from this and say, okay, it is some family of ultra filters of this form, and the representation is this one, except that the ultra filters are a certain one. Okay. And now, uh, last important thing is the tower condition. Tower condition says, suppose that you have a representation for a set. Now, when you want to test if a point isn't there, you have to find a Y such that the tower is well-founded. But checking whether a tower is well-founded means checking all sequences of major one sets, and there are many of them. The tower condition allows you to select one specific sequence of major one uh, uh, sets, which is a perfect test for your property. So, the point is that you have a function on the range of phi inside the ultra filter such that the image of an ultra filter selects one specific major one set in the ultra filter. And the tower you were looking for, this one, is well founded if and only if you see something through this specific sequence of major one sets. So, so you look at the uh, major one sets selected by F, you just check once there if there is something that goes through, and the tower condition ensures that then the tower is well-founded. So all other sequences are fine as well. <coughs> what is? Pi is the representation as before. Is this a function from finite sequences over lambda to ultra, uh, ultra filters, okay? And the point is that, that, that if you have the tower condition, then it's simpler to check whether the towers are well-founded or not, because you have a specific representative to check. Okay, now what, uh, what is important with this condition? Well, this follows out in the classical context because usually when you deal with this, kappa is very large, it's at least measurable or something like that, so it's larger than the continuum, and so you can prove that automatically every representation in that context has this tower condition, it's just a lemma, okay? In Woodin's case, it's not that automatic, so Woodin was not able to prove that in his paper, but was later proved by Kramer that if you have a representation, then you actually get this tower condition. Uh, uh, for free, okay? So we will deal with that. And now here is our main abstract theorem in this, uh, in this area. Suppose that you are working with any strong limit cardinal. Um, can be even omega, okay? Or can be Boudin's uh, lambda in I0, or can be anything else. The important thing is that it is strong limit and the finality omega. Take some level of completeness kappa, which is at least lambda. Then every set in lambda to the omega, which is Q representable with this tower condition, must satisfy the lambda perfect set property. And the point here is that unlike the proof by Shea and Kramer, which were very specific to Boudin's I0, so they were using the machinery that you have in this specific context, thank you, uh, here is just a purely classical proof. I mean, you just uh, work along the classical proof of weakly homogeneously, and you have to modify certain things, but it's like a very classical proof. So showing that this context is very close to classical descriptive set theory in a sense. Not only the result, but also the methods could be very close to that one. I hope to have the time to sketch at least the first part of the proof to show you that it's exactly the same uh, idea, the same proof. Let me first mention two important corollaries. Now, as I said, lambda can be anything satisfied on conditions. So if you move back to, you, uh, to Woodin's context, so I0, what you get? You get that if you have uh, I0 lambda, then everything that it is UJ representable has the perfect set property. And the point is that your representability here is the same as UJ representability there, more or less. You can transfer this. And the tower condition is for free in this context, so you have it. 
and therefore this is a natural consequence of our theorem. But it's just, you know, apply that to that specific lambda. It has nothing to do with uh, real machinery from uh, I zero. And also you can uh, extract from this uh, something else about this huge representability. What, what one can prove is that all lambda projective sets in this context are UJ representable. So in that case, you can remove the exact hypothesis. But if you take this larger standing point of view, then there is nothing special about booting V lambda plus one. You can just speak about any uniformly zero dimensional lambda polish space. And the, the result is exactly the same, okay? So you have a, a kind of purely, let's say, classical result because it speaks about completely metrizable spaces and lambda analytic which is, or lambda projective, which is very natural. And it says, if you assume certain large cardinal, then you get exactly the classical result, okay? So this is the main theorem. And I think I have seven minutes to present a part of the proof. Um, so here is the idea, okay? The main theorem is that if you have the representation with the tower condition, then you get the perfect set property. How it goes? Well, fix some representation and the witness of the tower property, so this selecting function, okay? Then you play a game, which is usually is called, well, no. Uh, when one plays this game, they are named after the set, but actually depend only on the representation and on the witness of the tower condition. So Z is there, but it's not very important. And the game goes as follows. Well, it's like the perfect set game. So player one offers lambda zero many possibilities of incompatible elements as a first step, okay? All these incompatible ele elements must have the same length. So J kappa is some natural number, which is the length of these uh, possibilities. And also, this is a technical difference from the classical context. Uh, here you have lambda zero many sequences. So they range can eventually reach lambda, can be uh, cofinite in lambda if you mix all the ranges. Instead, we re require that this doesn't happen. So if you take all the ranges, here, make the union, then this must be bounded below lambda. This is a technical difference from the classical context, motivated by the fact that lambda is uncountable. Okay, then he gives lambda zero many possibilities, two chooses one of these possibilities, and right after choosing the, the, this, then player one is in charge of producing some witness, Z zero, that certify that for the chosen sequence, the ultra filter partial witness to well funders. Okay, and this is an, an, another important thing. In the classical context, you don't have this tower condition because it's automatic. So you will not see in the game this, uh, this thing. And also the other important thing is that you should not ask one to produce a witness for all the sequences, but just let him wait, play to chase, choose one, and you must have in the pocket the right witness for that, okay? And then it goes on. After that, it chooses lambda one many sequences, ex extending the chosen one, okay? So second level of the embedding and player two chooses one of these, and for the chosen one, player one has to produce a witness of the world founders of the tower, and then you go on, okay? So it's like the perfect set game, but with these uh, uh, witnesses, okay? Now, the point is that at some point, since one has to produce these witnesses, it may happen that it was you know, producing a witness for the first step, then extend it, then extend it, and then player two makes it run into some possibility in which she cannot uh, extend further the, the sequence. And then he, he, uh, she cannot move, okay? So the point is that if one can move forever, she will have produced a witness of the well foundness. But it's not clear that she can move forever. Maybe she stops. So we say that player one wins if she can play for infinitely many times. So if she succeeds, uh, according to the choice of player two, to produce a witness for the well foundness of the appropriate uh, tower. Now, what, what does it mean? That if she wins, you look at the S0, S1, S2, etc., the chosen one, this is just a real, and she's producing the Y together with X, and also the Z go gives you the well founders of the uh, things. So what she has succeeded to do is that she has produced a real inside the set Z, because this is what you need to check to be in Z. So if one wins a run, then she builds some sequence which will be in the set Z as witnessed by Y, and the well foundness is this small Z, okay? So this is the idea. Now, it's clear that the, the game is closed because the point is just surviving for infinitely many times. So for player two is open, for player two is closed. So it is determined under AC. Since it is determined, then you can look at both possibilities. If player one has a winning strategy, well, she is just producing an embedding of lambda, product of lambda i, 
into the space, right? Because choose lambda zero, then lambda one, then lambda two, then lambda three, and you are producing just an embedding of the product of lambda i into your set. So it's clear that if one wins, then you get a set which contains a copy of the generalized Cantor space. So let us assume the other side. What if two has a winning strategy in, uh, in tau? Well, here the problem is that this looks very much like the classical game, but player one has to produce these many witnesses. And if you know the proof um, of the classical case, how does it go? It says, if you have a strategy for player two, well, essentially for each position, you find a certain set which cover partially your z, which is small, and then you count the number of possible position, and this must be too, not too large, so that the set is, um, is, is of the correct size. Now, how many positions do you have here? Well, a lot. A lot because you have this z here, which is something which lives on an ultra filter, which is on k to the n, where k can be any large cardinal, much larger than lambda, right? So you have too many choices for possible witnesses to say there are jo just lambda many positions, okay? So if two witnesses can run the usual argument. So what one has to do is to consider a variant of this game, which is the, the one with the star, in which player one, plays lambda zero many possibilities, then it is chosen one, and then at the next turn, she doesn't have to produce the witness. She just produced lambda one many possibilities. So this is much closer to the classical game, okay? And they go on. And now, what's the difference? She doesn't have to produce the witness, but for her to win, she must guarantee that the real she's producing with the S still is a member of Z. Now, what's the drawback of this? Of course, you don't have so many witnesses, but now this game is not determined in principle because it depends on the complexity of Z. You have to test at the end whether you are in the set or not. If the set is very complicated, this is not closed, it can, can be not non-determined, okay? Uh, so this is the drawback. You simplify the number of moves, but the game need not to be determined. So what you have to prove is the following. That actually, if you had a winning strategy before, so with witnesses, then from that you can reconstruct a strategy strategy of the game, in the end, is determined because the one with witnesses is, is determined, okay? And here is the proof, okay, I, I, I just will skip it because I don't have time, but this is exactly the classical proof. You use the measure to find out exactly what, what uh, I mean, to simulate a, a play in the older game, uh, to figure out what, what are the witnesses that one could have played somehow, using the measure. You have a canonical option and you, you take it. So it's just like in the classical case, and now I'm done because in the second game, you can prove that if two wins the game, then you have size lambda. Why? Well, because just as in the classical case, uh, you define a certain set which is here, is hidden, <laughs> it's not written, is AP. A certain set AP depending on some position P. Then you prove that the size of this AP is just lambda, but this is totally similar to the classical case. Well, of, we had to add some conditions, but it's totally similar to the classical case. And then, you prove that the Z is contained in the union of these sets, so you have just la uh, sets of size lambda, and then you have just to count how many P's are there, how many positions are there, and the second game now, you see that there are just lambda many of them, so this is just Z containing the union, but the union is a lambda union of small sets, and this is what makes uh, the job, okay? So uh, this is the end, sorry, I want to add one, uh, one word on this. Uh, the point here is not having just the same result in the, in the classical context. So, well, of course, it's, it's one of the things, but Kramer is a, is a better result with not, not representability at all. So the point is not having the best result in this direction, but showing that actually Woodens were, was right, meaning that this representability thing is actually gives you something very close to a classical setting, not just in terms of result. This was my, my personal wrong idea. My idea seeing the proof that he was Thing that the results look similar, but the, the, the technique is completely different. Well, at least in some specific case, uh, this shows that, well, no, actually it is the classical thing about, about uh, weakly homogeneous Susley represented in this more general context, okay? And, and this is one observation. The other observation that I want to make is that also Mirna was right, <laughs> okay? As you have seen, singular cardinals if you work in generalized descriptive theory with singular cardinal, for sure you get a much better picture, where better doesn't mean any ethical or philosophical, but just that it is closer to classical descriptive theory and can be said a little bit better because, as I showed you, it's not just about two to the lambda 
or V lambda plus one. This can be an objection. If someone just jump in and say, oh, but this is just for set theories, because who cares about V lambda plus one if I'm an analyst? Who cares about two to the lambda? Well, you should care, but you don't want to. So just to cheat you, <laughs> I will say you that this is not about these specific spaces. This is just about any completely metrizable space of density certain lambda. Okay? So this is just non-separable, completely metrizable spaces. So it's something that is more uh, amenable, I guess, to other fields of mathematics. Okay? So in this sense, you get a better picture. I mean, in this weak sense, better. Okay? Don't take it too seriously. Thank you for your attention.